Well, good evening. It is good to be here with you. It is, uh, I uh, stand in front of people a lot in my business and my job and, and talking from them, but this is totally different. And bringing the Word of God is uh, bringing a load of DOT regulations. So, uh, you know, when they, um, when they asked for us to sign up for something and uh, would you like to uh, speak one Sunday night, I said, sure, that'd be great. They said, would you like to do it? So I chose Ezra. And uh, there was a very spiritual reason for that. I have a grandson named Ezra, so that's why I chose the book of Ezra. <laughs> so, and then they, they gave me Nehemiah also. So tonight, I don't have a grandson named Nehemiah. Does that matter? I guess not. So tonight we're going to look at the good news of Ezra and Nehemiah. And I think in, in looking at these, uh, these two books, it's interesting as, as I researched, as I studied, uh, as we looked into these things, that neither of these books is quoted in the New Testament. Nothing from these books is mentioned in the New Testament as a direct quote. And so as we look at this tonight, I want to go through each book. Some will spend more time on than others, but there's some things that are going to be very, very much clear in, this, in these books. We have um, three common themes. The first one is you're going to see that God works through pagan kings. God does not always have to work through just a, a man called Christian or a, a godly man. God works his purposes and his designs and his will and his sovereignty is, is worked out through others also. And so we see tonight that three pagan kings were involved in all three exiles that came out of Babylon and back to Jerusalem. And so each one had its own purpose. Each one of these uh, exiles, they came and did a different thing. And so what we also will see that not only does God work through these pagan kings, but he also, there's always, always opposition. There's going to be opposition to whatever God does. That is clear. So if you're in the midst of what God is doing, be prepared for opposition, because in each one of these situations tonight, we're going to see that opposition takes place. And then finally, God's people, when they see God in action, when they are faced with opposition, when they see God come to them, when God gives them the word of God, when God comes upon them and surrounds them with his presence, with his word, and with others who are born of, of his blood, then you will see repentance, and you will see people beginning to obey the word of God. You see, what we face in this day, in this age, is, is not a whole lot different than what they faced with Ezra and Nehemiah. They came out of 70 years of bondage, as was prophesied in uh, Jeremiah chapter 25. And so after those 70 years are over, now we have a, a, new, a new king. And new kingdoms are set up. Persia is now ruling. And we have different kings that are going to be along that line. The one thing that, um, as we get started, I want you to turn, go ahead and turn to Ezra, chapter 1. We will spend most of our time in Ezra and Nehemiah. But one thing I would like us to, to note is that in our call to worship tonight, we read out of Isaiah chapter 45, seven verses. 150 years, 150 years before Cyrus became king, was king of Persia, 150 years before that, he was foretold in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah said in 150 years from now, he didn't quote those times, but that's the time frame, this will come about. Cyrus will be king, and he will lead the people back to Jerusalem. Now, Cyrus is a pagan. Cyrus is not a godly man, and we will see more about that. So let's look in chapter 1, verse 1, and we'll read. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you, of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with all free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So we start off in, in Ezra chapter 1, 
You don't hear anything of Ezra. Ezra doesn't come into play until chapter 7. But what we do see is that the king has made a proclamation. Now, why would he do that? How in the world would he know? He doesn't study the scriptures. He doesn't know what goes on. He's not a man that is obviously in tune with God. But all of a sudden, here's a man that says, the God of Israel has given me this power, this oversight of all this to construct a temple in his land. Many believe that Isaiah told him, and, and that's probably a pretty good guess, but we will see that uh, one of the uh, scholars, historical scholars, uh, Josephus, does record an account of the day when Daniel read Isaiah's prophecy to Cyrus. In response, he was moved to declare the proclamation. So there are writings, they're just not in our scriptures, but there are writings of people who say that Isaiah wrote and told him of that. So here is a pagan king, and he says, anybody want to go back to Jerusalem and set up the temple? God has given me the ability to oversee that and to send you and to be Lord over all this. And so here we are in chapter 1 and 2 of Ezra, the king's calling God's people out, and he says, come if you're willing to go to Jerusalem. Now at that time, Jerusalem had no king. There was no king in the land. So who would lead them? Who would they follow? Who would be the one to go and, and to resurrect the temple? Well, we find that as we look into these chapters, Zerubbabel was the man that was chosen. Now he was in the David line of kings, but he was not a king himself, but he was in the divinic line. So therefore, he was the one that led them. So we see this in chapter 3. Now they will worship when they get, to the, they get to the land. They call out the people and they start moving that way. There's about 50,000 people that go through this first exodus. Okay, and this is much like it was in, Gen, I mean, uh, in the exodus with, uh, when they left Egypt. The same thing, the same kind of concept. The people are coming. They follow Zerubbabel and about 50,000 go into the land. And what's the first thing they set up? The first thing they're going to do before they set up the temple. But we look at that in chapter 3. So if you turn to chapter 3, it says, Now in the seventh month came, in verse 1, and the sons of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. And then Jeshua, the son of Zodiac, and his brothers and the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, and his brothers arose and built an altar of God of Israel. <clears throat> Excuse me, to offer burnt offerings on it, as it was written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So they set up the altar on its foundation, for they were terrified because of the peoples of the land. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord. Burnt offerings morning and evening. They celebrated the Feast of Booths, and it was written and offered in the fixed number of burnt offerings daily, according to the ordinance, as each day required. And afterward, there was a continual burnt offering also for the new moons and all the fixed festivals of the Lord that were consecrated. And for everyone who was offered a free will offering to the Lord. So what they do, they went and set up an altar and they began to worship. See, the first thing they did when they got back to the land is they set up an altar and they worshiped. They didn't build the temple first. They didn't go into some kind of meeting. They went back and they worshiped. See, a lot of times, I, as, I, as I run parallels into our lives, as I look at this, Cyrus, yes, he, he ordered it. Uh, he was called to do that. And so when God's people went back, the first thing they did is they set up a place of worship. They set up a worship point, which was the actual altar of God. And so as we see that, as we look at that, I just challenge us in our own lives a lot of times. We have discomforts. We have problems. We have issues. And as I look at Ezra and I look at this book, and I see the sons of Israel, that they were in bondage for all these years. And, and throughout, if you read the book of Isaiah, throughout Isaiah, they're always in trouble. They're always in bondage. They're always in captivity. There's never a point in them where they're settled, where they're actually glorifying God in all they do. And so they're constantly returning. They're constantly coming back. And God is constantly restoring them, and then they fall back. And so here in Ezra, they have an opportunity to once again go back to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is occupied by other people at this point. All right? They didn't just leave it uninhabited. When they were taken over, when Babylon took everything over, and they destroyed the temple and everything was gone, other people inhabited Jerusalem. 
So now you have to understand that they're fearful of going back into that area. They're fearful of going back into Jerusalem. Maybe there's places, in, and I look at my own life, there are places I am fearful to go into because they're occupied by something other than godliness. Many times we choose not to go someplace, not to say something, not to go where God's calling us to go because of our fear. We're fearful. We're fearful of man. We're, we're fearful of the enemy. We're, we're fearful of a lot of different things. We're fearful for health of our lives. We're fearful for death. We have fear that runs through us. And these Israelites, they said, we are terrified in verse 3. It says, we're terrified because of the peoples of this land. This world should not terrify us. This world is not, it's where we live, but it's not what we're made of. And so when we see that the they are back in Jerusalem and they have set up this kingdom. I'm sorry, they've set up this altar. We now see that they're coming to a place where they are going to start building the temple. And that starts in verse 8 of chapter 3. And so they begin the groundwork. They, they get the people in place and they have the measurements and they start building it. And they get the foundation laid. And just like anything in any life, there has to be a foundation laid. And so now we're, we're here and we see the foundation is laid. And so they rejoice, they sing, they're all dressed up, they've got their uh, outfits on, the priests are dressed, they're adorned, the people are there, the foundation is laid, and, and there are shouts of joy that are heard all over the, all over the region. And there's also weeping. And you question, well, why are there shouts of joy and why, are there, why is there weeping? Well, just 50 years earlier, the original temple was destroyed. And there are some men there who are 70 or older probably, who have remember what the other temple looked like. This temple was not to be compared to that temple. This is a new temple. This is a new place that God will, will dwell. And so they are, there are shouts of joy, and then there's, then there's shouts of, of crying because they knew what used to be. And now their disobedience, it's no longer there. So they have to move past what they currently know, what they, what they used to know. You cannot live, we cannot live in what was in our past. The Christian life is not what I had. The Christian life is what does God have for me today and moving forward to tomorrow. We cannot dwell on the decisions we made. We cannot dwell on the sins we created. We can repent and we can move forward. But here we are in Ezra chapter 3. And they're weeping and they're mourning, some because of what it was, but many are rejoicing because of what will be. And in our own lives, we need to rejoice for what will be and where we are headed. But in chapter 4, lo and behold, the adversaries come. All right, they come. When adversaries come, they, they have a decision to make. They can believe what the adversaries are telling them. They can believe what the enemy tells them. They can, they can rest in that. They can receive that. How many times does someone tell you something that's contrary to the word of God and you accept it, you receive it, you, you bring it into your life, you make that gospel, you make that the truth in your life. And instead of worshiping God and walking in those truths of the word of God, we walk in the frightfulness, we walk in the fears that man puts upon us. And so here they are, ready to, they have the groundwork, it is set, it is done, and in verse 4, it says, now when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the fathers and the households and said to them, let us build with you, for we like you seek your God. And we have been sacrificing since the days of Eshadon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. Now, that sounds great. Hey, let us help. Let us, let's be a part of this. We've been worshiping the same God you have forever, for always. This is what comes to my mind is when, when you share Jesus Christ with somebody, and we'll move into to Christ right now. When you share Christ with somebody, and they say, well, I am of this faith, or I believe in this, or I believe in that, and say, let's all worship together. Is that acceptable or is that right? Or is that following the same God? You see, it's not. 
See, we can have common purposes in life. We can be against abortion. We can, we can be against uh, sexual sins. We can be against whatever sin you want to name. But if, if we are not on the solid ground that Jesus Christ, him crucified, buried, and raised again is the only hope of man, if that is not what they believe, if they believe something attached to that or different than that, we are not worshiping the same God. We are not preaching the same gospel. These folks come and they say, we want to be a part of this. We want to help you build that because we worship the same God you do. But they don't. So, But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers and the households in verse 3 of Israel said to them, you have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God, but we ourselves will together build to the Lord God of Israel. As King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. So they throw Cyrus in there just in case God maybe wasn't strong enough. Let's give Cyrus a ring because Cyrus is the one that gave us the order. We're obeying his commands because really these people are not worshiping the same God. They know that. We know that. So he brings in Cyrus in this. Cyrus is the one who commanded us. And then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah. So the people, the inhabitants that are living there, now come against Judah. Now they come against the ones who have come to rebuild the temple. And he says in, in verse 4, it says, They discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of King Cyrus of Persia, even into the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So here we are. Cyrus is still king, and what happens? They stop. They stop. The enemy has come in. The enemy has made accusations. The enemy has accused them. And for 16 years, they stopped building the temple. They had the command of Cyrus. They had God's anointing. God was with them. But 16 years go by, and they haven't done a thing because of the fear of the people that were in the land. You know, and I do realize that many times we don't do the things that God has called us to do because of the fear of man. And so here they spent 16 years. Now, what are they doing those 16 years? What do you think they're doing? Um, they're still in the land. They're still there. They're just not working. They're not doing anything. So we go to chapter 5. And we look at the first two verses, it says, When the prophets Haggai and the prophet Zechariah, the son of Idu, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel who was over them, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shedetel, and Jeshua, the son of Jezoadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God who were with them, supporting them. I'm not going to make you go to Haggai. Uh, chapter 1, but, but reading the prophet Haggai, I'll just read a few verses. Verse 1, it says, In the second year of Darius the king, the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by hand of Haggai to the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, governor of Judah. Yes, Zerubbabel was the governor, not a king, but a governor. And to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to build the house, to rebuild the house of the Lord. And what he's saying to Zerubbabel, he is saying that the people who have come to rebuild the house say, uh, it ain't time to rebuild the house. And why did they say it ain't time to rebuild the house? Because they were fearful of the people that lived there. In verse 3 uh, of uh, Haggai chapter 1, it says, then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. It is a time for yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruin. That's a question. He says, so you're going about building your own houses, your own kingdoms, while my house lays in ruin. You see, the Lord recognizes that when the people stopped working, what they did is they started tending to their own affairs. And man does that, don't we? We do that. When we stop witnessing, we stop ministering, we stop loving others regardless of the situation, once we stop that, we start tending to our own desires, our own affairs, our own needs. We build our own houses. We build our own kingdoms. We, we watch the stock market. We go by the uh, fishing gear, the golf clubs, 
We start putting other things in place of God because it's too uncomfortable to follow what God has said do. And so here we are in Haggai. He's challenging them with this. And so he encourages him, says, Now therefore, says the Lord of hosts, and still in Haggai, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you're never satisfied. You drink, but you still need, you have not your fill. You clothe yourself, but you're not warm. And he who earns wages is, puts them in a bag with hose. Your money's gone. You're always edgy. You're never happy. You're never satisfied. These are the Israelites. Even though they've been challenged to go, they've been commissioned to go back and build the temple, they're afraid of man. So in chapter uh, 1 of verse 12 of Haggai, we'll finish with that. It says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai the messenger of the Lord spoke to the people with the Lord's message, I am with you, declares the Lord. So once again, fear for 16 years consumed them. But now the people have been re-encouraged, they've been re-energized, they are now moving on, they're going to build the temple. So now the people of the other lands, they see that the Israelites are going back at it. They're going to start building again. And so what happens? The people of the land, uh, they repeat what Zerubbabel had told them about Cyrus, giving them the command, and they went to the king. So Jarius is now a king, and they go to the Jarius and say, hey, they said they were given a commission by Cyrus. They said this, they said this, they said this. And so they said, Jarius, if the king will, please find that decree from Cyrus and make sure they're telling the truth. So basically, now they're going to try and and call the Israelites liars that Cyrus did not give them that command. All right, so that's their mission here. So Jarius goes, he looks, he locates it, and he finds it, and he reads the decree. And in chapter 6, verse 7, this is what he says. He says, let the work on this house of God alone. He's talking to the accusers. He's talking to the enemies of Israel here. He says, leave it alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I will make a decree regarding what you shall do for these elders and the Jews for rebuilding the house of God. So Jairus is going to say, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you guys. Since you've complained about them, since you've brought this false claim about them, here's what I'm going to let you do. The cost is to be paid to these men in full without delay from the royal revenue, the tribute of the providence from beyond the river. This is where they were from. And whatever is needed, bulls, rams, sheep, burnt offerings, or the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, oil, as the priests of Jerusalem will require, let it be given to them day by day without fail, that they may offer pleasing sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the king and his sons. So what he does, he says, you false accusers, I'll tell you what, you're going to pay for it. You're going to provide the lambs. You're going to provide all the sacrifices, and you're going to give it to them every day as they have need. Now, the king, I really like what the king does here. He says, and that way when they sacrifice to their God, they will pray for the life of the king and his sons. Never take an opportunity not to um, entice the, uh, another God to be on your, your side. So the king, he has all these kingdoms. He has all these people. They have all these gods. He says, and maybe when they sacrifice to their God that they will pray for the life of the king and his sons. So it's kind of like, um, oh, by the way, if your God's real, go ahead and pray for me and my son so maybe we'll have, we'll have the benefit of your prayers. So here we are, Darius commands that, they go on, and sure enough, as we end chapter 6, the temple is completed. The temple is consecrated, it is completed in the sixth year of the reign of Zarius. So that's the first six books of Ezra. And so as time moves on, we are going to have to move on quicker. But I understood that because between verses 6 and 7, there's a gap. It is 59 years, and that is when the book of Esther uh, comes into play. We will hear that, I believe, next week. Um, But after that, in chapter 7 through 10 of Ezra, we go on, and that's when Ezra comes into being. That's when Ezra starts. um, The king now is Artaxerxes. And he is the king of Persia. And in verse 6 of chapter 7, uh, Ezra says, He went up from Babylonian. He was scribe, skilled in the law of Moses, 
that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given, and the king granted him all he asked. So Ezra, once again, he went to King Artaxerxes, and he wanted to take a group, and he wanted to go and also uh, teach the people. He wanted to teach the people. So about seven or 8,000 went with Ezra, the king, and they declared a decree that they were to be supplied with all their needs, everything they wanted. Nothing was to be withheld from them. He gave them papers um, and what have you. And one of these things that um, was interesting, Ezra in verse 10 of chapter 7, this is a man, uh, this is the man Ezra. It says, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances to Israel. Ezra's whole focus, whole purpose was to study the law of the Lord, to teach it and to practice it. You know, it's one thing to learn scripture. It's one thing to know scripture. It's, um, it's one thing to, to be able to tell people what scripture says, but it's the man who practices it and the man who teaches it, and the man who shares it with others, that is the man that God will use. A man of anything lesser is a man that, that seeks after his own desires, seeks after his own uh, accolades, seeks after his, his own benefits. But a man of God will seek the benefit of others, will teach the word to others. And so here we see that, that Ezra is that man. In verse 25, after the, the king gives a long decree, but I want you to see what he says. Now, this is another pagan king. Artaxerxes is pagan. He is not Christian. Verse 25 of chapter 7, it says, And you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God that is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people in the providence beyond the river, all such as know the laws of your God. And those who, you, who do not know them, you shall teach. Verse 26, whoever will not obey the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be strictly executed on him, whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of his goods or for imprisonment. A pagan king trusting a man of God. Why would he do that? Because Ezra showed himself to be a man of integrity, a man of his word, a man who spoke of God and who followed God and who worshiped God. That is why a pagan king would give him the ability to set up his own, basically his own country. Proverbs 21.1, probably a familiar passage to us all. One of my favorite verses in Proverbs, even in the books of the Bible. It says, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. The king's heart is in the Lord's hand. The king thinks he has rule. The king thinks he has the authority. And, and while he does over what the Lord allows him to have, his heart belongs, and the direction of his heart belongs to God. We have seen now that Cyrus, Darius, and Xerxes, or Xerxes, sorry, they have all pagan kings, and yet every one has turned their heart towards the man of God. And God is restoring his people in his temple to this point. In these final verses, we will see in Ezra chapters 9 and 10, uh, we will see repentance from Israel. They had idol worship. They were married. Uh, they had married outside of God's call, as it was in uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy. So they had married foreign uh, women, men, children. So God, uh, God had told them that you need to repent. You need to go back to what I, the statutes which I gave you. And so in these verses, 9 and 10, chapter 9 and 10, that's what they did. And I'll just read two verses and we'll close out of Ezra. It'll say in 9, 15, O, God, o Lord, the God of Israel, you are just. For we are left a remnant that has escaped as, a, as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt. And none can stand before you because of this. Here they are confessing their sin, repenting of their sin. Chapter 10, verse 1. When Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, a very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him out of Israel, for the people wept bitterly. 
They wept bitterly over their sin. They wept bitterly over grieving God. And they wanted to turn their hearts back to him. Two things out of the book of Ezra is Ezra would always, he agreed with God, he taught God, and the people separated from their sins. And quickly we'll move over to Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was not a king. He was not a priest. Uh, he was a cupbearer. He was a cupbearer for the king. And so in that, uh, that's quite a job. Uh, if he lives, the king lives. If he dies, they get a new cupbearer. Because obviously something they were going to give the king didn't, didn't work out too well. So we, we see that he's a, he's a cupbearer in, uh, in chapter 1. This is about 445 B.C. It's in the 20th year of Persian King Artaxerxes. Nehemiah was the cupbearer for the king. He had asked his brother while being the cupbearer and some other men from Judah how it was for the ones who had escaped and survived the captivity about Jerusalem. When he heard the report, he sat down and he wept. When we hear a report... When we hear a report of, of trouble, of travail, of, of catastrophe, um, of murder, of whatever the case may be, what do we do? How do you handle those things? Do we, ah, man, that's a tough break. Do we begin immediately and, and pray? Do we, do we weep for each other? Do we mourn for each other? You see, he's the cupbearer. He has a confidence with Artaxerxes, the king. He is a right-hand man. He is um, one who probably shares intimate talks with him. And he hears that his people in Jerusalem, the walls are broken. The temple has been built, but they have no walls to protect them. And so it breaks his heart, and immediately he begins to, to pray. He begins to weep, and it says... In chapter 1, verse 4, it says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you, have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. He goes on to pray and, and ask that God would remember the word that he gave to Moses. Remember it. And, and in verse 11, he says, Oh, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. He's asking him for mercy in the sight of who? Who is this man? Well, it's Artaxerxes. It's the king. He's asking that God will give him mercy in his sight. Why is he wanting mercy in his sight? Because he's going to ask him for something. He's going to ask the king a question. And the king, if he doesn't like the question, what could happen? Well, you could, I'll get a new guy. You're dead. He'll kill him. He'll execute him. And so it says... At the end of that statement, he says, now, I was a cupbearer to the king. Now, four months pass. It's been four months since he, since he prayed, has been praying, has been fasting, has been before God. So in chapter 2, he is before the king one day, and his countenance is sad. Now, if you know anything about uh, that, that time when the cupbearer, when anyone comes in the presence of the king, they're not to show sadness, they're not to show discomfort, they're not to show anything that would make the king upset or, or uh, for some reason make him feel that something's wrong. You're always supposed to be upbeat and what have you. One day he came in and his countenance was sad. And the king perceived this and he said, this is not a countenance of sadness, this is not a countenance of sickness, it is a countenance of the heart. Your heart is sad. So the king asked what was wrong and so Nehemiah says, I am very much afraid. And we've heard that before because very much afraid. He was afraid to say what he wanted to the king, but he did. And in verse 3, he says, Nehemiah shared with the king all that was in him. And he says, let the king live forever. That was a standard phrase. When you went before a king, you would say, let the king live forever. 
he goes, obviously he's the king. You don't want him to die. So you come with that, you, you butter him up a little bit, but that's let the king live forever. And the king asked him, what would you request? You see, he didn't chastise him. He didn't do anything. He said, what would you request? So Nehemiah laid out his entire plan. Now, I, I want us to look real quick as I, I'm going to get through this, but Nehemiah already had something in mind. He already knew what his plan was. When the king, if the king was to ask him a question, what do you need from me? Nehemiah was ready to respond. He knew what God had told him to do. He knew what his plan was. He knew what was going to happen. Many times we will go ask somebody something and, and we'll get a response from them and, and we don't have anything else to say because we didn't expect the response. He expected the response from Artaxerxes to say, what is it you require? So he required that he would go back to Jerusalem and he would build the wall. And so Artaxerxes said, okay, how long will you be gone? When will you come back? And so he laid out the plan. He gave him all the plans, and he told him what would happen. And so in chapter 2, verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 19, he ran into opposition, of course. Sambalat and Tobiah, uh, they took issue, and they wanted to know why he was doing this, and they accused him of doing this to set up his own kingdom, that he would be king, and they chastised him, and they made fun of him. And they, uh, they said, hey, we're going to go tell the king on you. We're going to go tell the king what you're doing. And they continued to make the people fearful. So in chapter 3, after all this is done, they start this rebellion. But after this, in chapter 3, they give out assignments. Chapter 4, uh, Sambalai and Tobiah come back and they issue accusations against them. They, they question their motive. They say, you're doing this for yourself to set up your own kingdom. They question why they would sacrifice to a god. They, they exaggerate how long it would take. They say, can you do this in a day? Actually, it took 52 days. And they, they said it's an impossibility. You can't revive these stones one on top of another. So everything that God had told them to do, the enemy comes in and tells them it can't be done. But what did they do? And Tobiah, Tobiah is like a little, I don't know, he's like a little runt who kind of hangs out with the bully. Tobiah goes, and if a fox jumps on the wall, it'll fall down. What is that? I mean, you know, he's like a little kid, a little punk. And so this is kind of the attitude that they had, the kind of attitude that they gave with this. So it says, uh, so what's he do? And this is what we should do. He prays. He says, hear, O Lord, hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt or let their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. He prayed in the face of ridicule. Most of the time we try to defend ourselves. Don't, we, don't, we don't need to defend ourselves. We need to stay true to the word of God. We need to stay true to God's purposes. Let God do the battle. Nehemiah and his people let God battle. They did not go to battle with words. They did not go to battle with try to explain. They let God do the battle. So, so what happens, the wall is about halfway built, and they come back at him again and uh, again. So what Nehemiah does in wisdom, he realizes they want to have a meeting with him. He says, no, I'm not going to meet with you guys. They try that four times. On the fifth time, they come back to him, and they say, we want to meet with you. And he says, no, I'm not going to meet with you. He says, we're going to go tell the king. And then another guy comes, and he says, let's go into the temple, and let's, let's hide there, and you won't be hurt there. And he said, I ain't going to do that either because he realizes it's not of God. Listen, all these things, the world comes at you, the enemy comes at you, and they try to convince us that their way is okay, that their way is the way. That is never the case. So the wall gets completed, 52 days. They rejoice. And as we wrap this up, the last six chapters, 7 through 13 of Nehemiah, there's much to be found there. The scriptures are located. See, up to this time in, in chapter 7, verse 5, um, Nehemiah opens the book in the sight of the people, and he says, <clears throat> as he opened, as he stood, and Ezra blessed the Lord, O great God. And the people answered, Amen, Amen. And they lifted up their hands and they bowed their heads and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Verse 8, they read the book from the law. It was clearly and gave them the sense so that the people understood the reading. You see, they had to explain the reading in many different languages. 
They had been in Babylon 70 years. Many of the people did not know Hebrew. Much of this, uh, several parts of these books are, are written in Aramaic because that was the language that they used to make proclamations and decrees back then. So it's not written in Hebrew. So they're trying to interpret, they're trying to understand for those who did not know Hebrew. And so, but they were in fasting and sackcloth in chapter 9, their lives began to be changed because they began to repent. I want you to see the common theme. Every one of these exodus that came back to Jerusalem, eventually the people repented. Now, on the 24th day of the month, this is in chapter 9, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins of iniquities to the fathers, to the Father. And this went on for hours. There's a prayer here in chapter 9 that we do not have time to look at, but it went on for hours and hours. And I want us to look at one final thing as I close. He told the king, Artaxerxes, when he sent him off, what was the one thing he said? He said, how long will you be gone? And Nehemiah gave him a time. So we look at that as, as we close. Uh, I think it's chapter 13, verse 7. It says, after some time, I asked to leave the king and came to Jerusalem, and I discovered the evil Ishabiah had done for Tobiah, preparing him for a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And this is Nehemiah speaking. I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture to buy out of the chamber. And then I gave orders and cleansed the chambers and brought it back there, the vessels of the house of God and the grain offering and the frankincense. Tobiah did exactly what they did in the temple in Jesus' day. He had, he had taken room up in the temple, and Nehemiah came back and threw him out. But you notice, see, after some time he asked to leave the king, Nehemiah went back to the king just as he had promised. A man of God will always, always speak the word of truth, walk in truth, and be honorable in what you say to people. If you say yes to something, let it be yes and do it. If you say no, let it be no and don't do it. He fulfilled his commitment to the pagan king, and out of that, the people of God rejoice. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful that you have given us these books of encouragement. And Lord, that, uh, that you use the, the kings of this world, the uh, pagan kings, kings that do not know you, that you use them for your good and your glory. And all these things that, uh, that work out, they work out for the glory of God and for the good of his children. So Lord, we are thankful for that. Lord, I pray now that we will cleanse our hearts as we partake of the Lord's Supper, we give you praise, we give you glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mr. Doug.